This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Prominent chef and media personality, Sarah Moulton, on this edition of Conversations. Sarah Moulton's accomplished culinary career spans more than four decades. During that time, she worked with Julia Child, co-founded the New York Women's Culinary Alliance, served as food editor for Good Morning America, was executive chef for Gourmet Magazine, and hosted shows on the Food Network. She's the author of several cookbooks. Her latest is Sarah Moulton's Home Cooking 101, How to Make Everything Taste Better. These days, you can find many of her appetizing ideas on her PBS show, Sarah's Weeknight Meals. She also writes for a couple of major media outlets and appears regularly on Chris Kimball's Milk Street Radio on NPR. We welcome Sarah Moulds into Conversations. Thanks for joining us and welcome to Florida. Well, Jeff, thanks for inviting <laughs> me. I'm so excited to be here. Tell me, how did your love for culinary arts begin? Oh my God, I live to eat. Um, I mean, until I was nine, I was a butterball. Okay. Um, I just ate hot fudge sundaes and hot dogs and my mother was tearing her hair out. Uh, it wasn't exactly culinary fair. And then puberty hit and I, I liked boys. And I was like, oh, I can't be a butterball. This is not gonna work. So I sort of switched eating habits. And the good news was my mother was a fantastic cook. So I started paying more attention to what she was cooking and then I gradually joined her in what she was cooking. Okay. And so we used to throw these dinner parties when I was in junior high and high school because she'd go to Europe and come back and we'd have to make the meal, the paella, the spanakopita, the whatever from wherever she'd been. And the good news was we lived in New York City so we could mostly get the ingredients and we had the New York Times cookbook by mm. Craig Claiborne, which had all those international recipes. I mean, now everybody knows what these things are. Right. But, you know, when I was growing up in the 60s, nobody did. Uh, it was very exotic. Yeah. So that's how I got started. But I'm always thinking about the next meal to this day. Even if it's some, you know, dreadful airplane meal, I'm thinking about it. You know, what's next? What's next? So I live to eat. That's what motivates me. You mentioned about um, becoming a more of a healthy eater and being aware of your, your dietary needs and whatnot. Tell me, it seems to me that that's more top of mind these days, perhaps than it ever has been. How has that changed over your four decades? Oh, my God. Well, we went through that bad period when, uh, really, I, here's what I think, when uh, fat was made the demon. Right. And the trouble is, and this is scientific, that when you remove fat from recipes, so that was whatever it was, the ladies in, in the 90s, when you move fat from a recipe, you know, don't only remove its mouth appeal, you know, because it, it's nice. Right. You don't only lose its its individual flavor. Some, some don't have any flavor, but let's face it, things like bacon do or sure. chicken skin. But you also lose something that it does that's very important. It's a conductor of flavor. So things without fat just taste lackluster. So to make up the difference, people started putting in sugar. Right. Um, so what people would do, and I'm not casting aspersion on them at all, but would buy the box of snack wells and eat the whole thing. And that had a lot of sugar in right. it. So I see that as the beginning of the obesity era. Right. And um, that sort of threw us in a terrible direction to the point where I forget what percentage of Americans are overweight, but it's horrible. It's a large percentage. And it, it is very hard to lose weight. I mean, we must and nobody should be discouraged, but uh, it, people, it just got out of control because sugar was put in everything and people sort of became addicted. Right. So yes, it's, it's a very important thing right now and a lot of people realize it and um, hopefully are working on it. It seems to me that there's a bigger move today on the um, folks being more um, vegetarian or vegan. Which, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's great. I think it's really great. Uh, there's plenty of protein you can get from, you know, vegetable sources, you know, legumes, for example. Um, and it's just Altogether, it's far, it's far better for the planet uh, to not eat quite as much meat. I, I eat meat, by the way. I'm not anti-meat. Uh, but I, it's just much better for the planet, but also it's, ultimately it's much better for your health. If you eat you know, more smaller portions of meat, right. eat like the Europeans or the Medi they do in the Mediterranean, right. where it's all about the grains and the beans 
and, and the vegetables and the olive oil and right. maybe a little bit of wine, I hope. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the lean proteins, they have just, they're, you know, it's just a much healthier diet. And, you know, they keep circling. It changes all the right. time about what's the best diet. And there's all these fad diets. And I think right. they're all ridiculous because they eliminate food groups, which you should never do because... Right. All those different food groups bring something to the mix, bring nutrition in their own little way to you. And once you start throwing out all, it's just stupid. But the one that doctors keep coming back to as being the healthiest is the Mediterranean. Yeah. I, I was going to say that. Yeah. I, I read that. Yeah. And if you think about all the things that you can eat on that, it's really good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. 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 When, when you are coming up with a recipe, are you thinking health? I absolutely am. I've always got in the back of my mind... Um, a lot of things. Uh, the, the sodium is a little bit of an issue for me as a chef. So I love it when they come out with studies saying that maybe sodium's not so bad, but I have to, <laughs> I have to look at that too. But um, the fat, I try to keep it down just for calorie reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, there is fat in every single recipe I do. Um, yeah, I really try to think about it, how much protein. The protein is always three to four ounces per person. I, I mean, animal-based protein. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, whole pork tenderloin for four people. Why not? Even though it only wears, weighs a pound, because whatever else you do to it, you know, if you bread it or if you add a sauce to it, there's more going on than just the protein. So, yes, very, very, very much I'm thinking about it. Do you have a favorite food group? You mean something I love to eat more than anything yeah. else? If I'm being naughty? Well, both. Um, well, I love soup, and that's not a food group, but I just love soup. I, my husband really turned me on to it as, like, the main deal. Right. Yeah, He would have it as a first course, but he'll also have it as an entree. Right. But um, if I'm being naughty, I just say naughty because it's fattening, as right. it can be. Right. Cheese. I am okay. such a cheeseaholic. Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of what I really love to eat, I, right now I am going through quite a vegetable fra phase, okay. and I hope it sticks. So, and, but I love my bread. Yeah. Yeah, how about you? Oh gosh. Well, you know, I love fish, oh, seafood. I do too, and I didn't eat it till I was 35. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Um, and and believe it or not, I love spinach. Yes. I, I can eat tons of spinach. Uh, How about baby kale? Are you okay with that? I'm okay with kale. My daughter has turned me on to kale, yeah. so I because the little the tender amount. guys yeah. are not quite so. Yeah. Some people find it a little too aggressive, but, but those little guys are but good. I love um, I love broccoli, cauliflower. I love all the the vegetables. crucifers. Yeah, Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. They're so good for you. The yeah. crucifers are way up there. They're so good for you. But I'll tell you something. I also love a good steak. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's you funny know. if I lost a few more pounds and felt like I wanted to splurge and it would be okay. I would have a cheeseburger. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> but you know, oddly enough, I've tried to cut back as I get older. And one of the things that was easy for me to give up, not that this show's about me, but... but, but <laughs> I asked you. I'm interested. Honest, but it's cheese. So if I'm going to have, I would rather have just a good hamburger. I can do without the cheese. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I but, hear you. Anyway. Well, tell me about your career. I thought it was fascinating. You you, you worked with Julia Child. I did. And, and she's such a legend, particularly to folks who watch PBS. Right. What was that like and how did it come about? Well, it was fantastic. I was working in Cambridge as the chef manager of a catering operation, which I actually hated, but it was a stepping stone to a restaurant where I was going to become a chef. And one day we were peeling a million hard-boiled eggs, me and my worker. Her name was Barrett Pratt. And we were talking about how Julia boils eggs, which is to not boil them. And she said, you know, I'm a volunteer on Julia Child's show, her PBS show. I was like, really? She, what she also didn't tell me was that her mother, Pat Pratt, was one of Julia Child's best friends. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. But at any rate, she said, um, yeah, yeah, I'm a volunteer. She has lots of volunteers. I said, well... Sign me and, up. <laughs> yeah, so she came back in the next day. She said, I'll talk to Julia about it. We're just about to tape another sh season, um, Julia Child and we're company. And she came in the next day, and she said, oh, I told Julia all about you, and she wants to hire you. Wow. I said, pay me? Why? And she said, oh, I told her all about you. Go call her. Well, Julia was listed, so it was easy to call her. And people did all the time, okay. you know, including especially on Thanksgiving. Oh, I bet. You know, my turkey's been in the heated garage for three days. Can I cook it? And Julie would say, no, go out and get pizza. But anyway, so I called her, and she said, oh, dearie, I've heard all about you. Do you food style? Now, this is 1977. And 78, 78, 1978. And um, back then, it wasn't the codified art that it is now. Food styling has, you know, got rules and directions and 
there's mentors, there's books, it's, it's, and it's a very viable, for people wanting to go to the food industry, that's a place where you can make some money. Right. Um, and, but back then, no, I had no formal training. You know, I'd gone to the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, two-year program, worked in restaurants. I, I'd worked, been working in restaurants on a catering place. I'd just done cold poached decorated salmon for 700 but I'd never done it officially, right. so this is going through my mind. I, I was like, well, I did watercolors in high school. I plated nice food with my mom. So what did I say? What would you have said? <laughs> yes, I'm really good. <laughs> so I got the job. Awesome. And I'm now, you know, and over the time, you know, I, I wasn't bad at it, but right. it wasn't exactly like I was a specialist. Yeah. But What was she like working with you? She was so much fun. I thought we would just sort of sit at her feet. There was like 20 of us that worked right. on it. Only a few of us were paid. Um, and I just thought she'd tell us what the recipes were. But no, we were developing the recipes as we did the show. Really? Which is crazy. Yeah. I can't imagine doing that now. And uh, she relied on us for our opinion and our expertise. expertise. Uh, and so we would come in with ideas. Um, like I remember the bomb, bomb au tout chocolat, the <laughs> cake part of it. So it was, I forget if the inside was ice cream or what it was, but then it was a cake, and then it was like this shellac chocolate on the outside. The cake ended up being a brownie recipe from somebody's kid. You know, it was like she was totally open at that point. I mean, when she was the French chef, right. the French chef, she, she never called herself a chef, she would do things by the book. Right. But now all bets was off. This was Julia Child and more, com and company, more company. And we were just having fun. So everybody had an opinion, right. which sort of drove me nuts because I just wanted to learn from her. But <laughs> it was a great experience. And so we sometimes would do something like the gâteau de crip. We did, I don't know, like maybe 12 or 13 times. I mean, tried it out 12 wow. or 13 okay. times. So it was quite a process. Uh, but really fun. It was like a laboratory. I and can imagine, yeah. we taped three days a week. Um, I could only go two out of three because I then ended up having the chef's job. So the other five, I worked at a restaurant. But we just had such a great time. It was a wonderful place to be. Great. You also worked on Good Morning America, right? Well, be, again, because of Julia. Okay. So in 81, so I was, in, this was in Boston. I was working in Boston. Then my husband, who's in the mus music industry, dragged me to New York City where I'd grown up and I never thought I'd go back and it was it was actually hard to get a job but I finally did. Um, I missed Julia and she started working at Good Morning America and so I said let's have dinner and uh, when you come, next come to town she would tape like four or five episodes come with a couple of people to help her and she's like oh dearie I'm not sure I'll get done in time so I said well let me come in and work for free and then let's have dinner so we did and the next day, GMA hired me to start working with her. Wow. So that's how I got it. I, Julia Child was amazing. Opened. <laughs> I, she didn't just help me. She helped so many people. But right. because of her, I, I'm sure that's where why my career has been so successful. But I ended up doing all the prep for all the chefs behind the scenes at GMA for 10 years, from 87 to... So there was a little gap from when that little incident happened. I worked with her a bit and then had to leave because I had other jobs. But then I came back in 87, did it for 10 years. So I got to work doing all the food, the food styling right. and the prep and almost the producing. There were producers, but I would go through the rehearsal. Right. And so when the Food Network started in 93, they asked me to run the kitchen. And I didn't think the Food Network was going to last. <laughs> so I said, no, thank you, because I had a secure job by then at Gourmet with Benefits. Um, but it, it was because I did the thing at Gourmet that I understood sort of food TV right. behind, I'm mean, Gourmet, excuse me, at GMA behind the scenes right. that I understood how food TV worked. Yeah. You were executive chef at Gourmet Magazine. I was, and what that means, that's a very fancy title. Um, I was chef of the executive dining room. I started out in the test kitchen, testing, developing, and styling food for photography. I finally, you know, after the fact, learned how to do it. But then the job in the executive dining room opened up, and I loved it because I'm really a chef at heart. I started out working seven years in restaurants, uh, left to have kids and never went back. But um, the dining room opened up, and it, we entertained clients, meaning advertisers, right. and I had to make the magazine come alive. And I loved it because it was only 16 seats, 
and I had no food cost, yeah. which is heaven for a chef. <laughs> yeah. And we had to keep changing the menu because we had to represent the magazine. So I learned a ton by cooking from the magazine for our clients. It was a great job. I read, I, I believe someone in the New York Times, and I apologize for not recalling the, the journalist name, but and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but said when it comes to writing recipes, you're the best. Me? Wow. Okay. It was something along those lines. I well, mean, it was just putting was you... It, was this a couple years ago? Yeah, I believe so. I okay, because, so. you know, that might have been uh, the guy who's... I believe it was a lady that wrote the Oh, really? The article, okay. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. It was in, it was, I believe it was the Times. It could have been another New York publication. Oh, but, no, maybe it was the Washington Post. No, it was definitely a New Yorker, New York Times. I think. But, but uh, suffice it to say, it, obviously putting you up on a high oh, standard yeah. for, for your ability to do that. So what is it that makes you so good at doing that? Well, all those years at Gourmet, for sure, absolutely. Um, also, I eventually, you know, by doing what everything I've done, I eventually figured out that I'm more of a teacher than almost anything else. And when you're a teacher, you really want somebody to be successful. Right. And I understand there's two different kinds of home cooks. There's the home cooks that are more like chefs. They just sort of riff and have fun and throw things together. I think they're actually in the minority. And then the majority are like so scared and they need a recipe and they <laughs> need it to be precise. And so I cook for that group. You know, I applaud the other group. I, I say to the other group, just make my recipe once exactly the way it was written. And then after that, all bets are off, have fun. But for the, this group, the scared group, I want to make sure that it's so clear how to get from point A to point B to point C to a beautiful end result. And, and speaking of that, your book I have here in my lap, and it's called uh, Sarah Moulton's Home Cooking 101, How to Make Everything Taste Better. So what is the, what's the, the, the crux of this book? How do you make everything taste better? Well, it's all in the details. <laughs> that could have been the other subtitle uh, instead of how to make everything taste better. But um, I thought how to make everything taste better was more grabby. But it's all in the details, and, and it has to do with things like um, when you add the salt in a recipe. It makes a huge difference. Um, what kind of knife you have. Um, how you balance flavors. Um, using fat, mm -hmm. not not using fat. Um, all, the, all the little things, and, and uh, making sure the pan's hot enough, making sure, you know, a lot of it is the basic stuff I learned in cooking school and then as a chef, but a lot of it's also what I learned teaching home cooks, right. you know, and, and thinking the way they think and helping them to balance flavors. So, for example, um, I don't know if this is the most relevant thing on the planet, but really nobody should ever buy bottled salad dressing. It's so easy to make. Hmm. a nice dressing. But the proportions that we were all taught was three to one oiled vinegar. And that really doesn't fly because whatever the acid is, is has different acidity. So sometimes you need more oil and sometimes you need less oil. So for example, balsamic, which also came in in the anti-fat phase, balsamic has sugar in it. Uh -huh. um, but if you use balsamic, you don't need much oil because it's not very acidic and it's also sort of sweet. But if you have lemon juice, lemon juice can be both very acidic and not acidic at all. Sherry vinegar, so acidic, you almost need four tablespoons of oil. So there's a lot of those little details in there. Um, it's a lot of stuff I learned from um, Cook's Illustrated and other science, you know, right. sort of um, magazines um, about, there was, there was a lot of myths that we grew up with that just aren't true. Things like you should never salt your dried, when you're cooking legumes, dried uh -huh. beans, you should right. never salt them until the end because the salt will make them tough. Au contraire, if you put them in salted water overnight, the salt actually tenderizes the skin and seasons. It's like brining a turkey. Um, and then when you cook them, they're much more tender and much more evenly cooked and much more deeply seasoned. The thing about salt, which is like my biggest obsession clearly <laughs> is if you add it at the end let's say you make pasta uh -huh. and you add no salt to the water because you say to yourself well okay some people here don't like salt so we'll just add it at the end everybody will add way more salt than they would have had you salted the water because the pasta won't absorb it afterwards it will be like pasta with a salt hat it just doesn't go around the same way. It doesn't penetrate the that same way. Sense. But anyway, there's lots of those little kind of things. I start with the top 10 things that people need to know, including what's a great way to shop. Right. Um, I talk about, you know, the five flavors, you know, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, 
umami and how to balance them, you know, if they get out of whack, stuff like that. Awesome, awesome. Tell me about the TV show for PBS. Well, it's fantastic. I love, I love public television. I have to say, I'm not just saying that because we're here. No. <laughs> um, well, I started with Julia, and what I like about it is exactly what advertisers don't like about it is there's no product placement. There's yeah. no phoniness. It's, you just, because there can't be. Right. It's not allowed. Right. So our poor advertisers sort of have to get the halo effect of being associated with me, or I'll do demos with them later. But I can do what I want to do and talk about what I want to talk be, uh, talk about because it's pure. Right. And there's no advertisements. You know, there's some at the top and the bottom of the show. And you just go straight through for whatever it is, 27 minutes or whatever it is. And you focus on what you're doing, and I can pick what I what I want to talk about, and I can include topics that I think are important, like sanitation, right, or uh, sustainability, right. Um, you know, especially as regards say seafood, but on all topics, you know. Uh, recently, we did a show. Well, actually, in season eight, we have one on foraging. Okay. Um, I can talk about food waste. Yeah. I can talk about issues that I feel are important. Back when I was at the Food Network, I did 1,500 shows for them in 10 years. I couldn't use the word vegetarian. They, I mean, now they've changed. They've right. really evolved. But back then, they were afraid that people would hit the button and change the channel because people would thought, think that was a dreadful topic. I couldn't really <laughs> talk about sanitation because they thought that was unpopular. You know, you just can't talk about that. But I want, I, but I must. I want folks to get sort of a taste, if you will, of what the television show is all about. So we're going to play a trailer and then uh, we'll come back and talk some more about Sarah Moulton's television show for PBS. Hungry? Mm. Sarah's got you covered. I love it. I love it. With delicious, easy weeknight meals. It smells good. Take me way you take me way I am in the sky. Welcome to another season of Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Yeah, that's where the magic comes from. How'd you come up with the title, Weeknight Meals? That had been becoming my sort of brand. I hate that word brand. It sounds so yeah. hypey. But uh, when I was at the Food Network, I did a show called Cooking Live, and I talked to people live. You yeah. know, they'd call in. And uh, what we were really grappling with was weeknight meals. Yeah. And I just thought, this is... I grew up with family dinner being sort of our religion, right. and my husband did also, meaning that we made sure as a family to sit down every night and have a conversation. My mother was adamant about it, and it was so important to me, I wanted to make sure that my children got it, and they did, and they will carry it on, I guarantee you. <laughs> and so I just, I want to help people to do that, because we've got such busy lives Women are working, and they should. Why shouldn't they? Of course, right. you know we've got to figure out how to make it work in terms of childcare. But it's really hard to get dinner on the table when you come home at six or six thirty. Yeah. You're whooped. Yeah. You know you don't want to have to go into the kitchen. So I, I, that's when I really started focusing on how to make that happen every night of the week. Yeah. Why has why has culinary arts become so popular? I mean, chefs are almost like you know rock stars now yeah. in so many ways. What, what do you think? What well, do you think it started is? with the Food Network. Uh, you know, you have to say the Food Network really, and then of course there's all the offshoots and all the other stations. Right. Uh, so that for sure, and everybody thinks it's such a romantic lifestyle because it's so rogue, you know, and yeah. it's <laughs> you know you work a million hours and you know. It, there's a lot of drinking and carousing, and it all seems so, you know, it just seems so glamorous. Um, I mean, it is and it isn't. Yeah. Uh, but it's still hard work. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's really hard work. It's 80 hours. Yeah. And um, I, I, it, it's, it's hard work for anyway, anybody, but I want to make sure that everybody understands women are really good at it. Because every th when I went to cooking school, they tried to tell me, you can't stand the heat, you can't stand the pressure, you can't lift the pots. They're so wrong. Women are hardwired. You think about it. As a mom mm -hmm. and multitasking, we are hardwired to take pressure, to multitask. And as for lifting pots, you get a buddy and a pivot, and you're fine, <laughs> not a problem. My experience, I worked with all women, disaster. We all got on the same cycle and we're screaming at each other once a month. Um, I worked with all men, disaster. And I worked with a mix, which I loved because we yeah. all kept each other in check. But I, I found that women, 
and this is a gross exaggeration, it's not true for everybody, but oh, um, women were more calm in the kitchen, I found. So I, I, I got off, because obviously I wanted to talk about that. That's not what you asked me, but um, why are chefs becoming celebrities? Yeah. It's, it's really because of what you see on TV, I think. Yeah. So I've got about three minutes left. Just for fun, you live in New York City. So what's the New York culinary scene? I mean, it's, it's you know, obviously one of the you know, greatest cities oh, in the world. Oh, so what, competitive, what, so yeah. competitive. So you have sort of two situations. Um, you have Brooklyn and what's going on in the outer boroughs, yeah. which is very young and cool and hip and happening and cutting edge and fantastic, a lot of it. And then you have what's going on in New York, which I'd say, not that there aren't some of what I, we just, I just said, but the rents are so expensive. You have yeah. more of the high end, still some more of the European. Um, it, it's, it's more expensive in Manhattan and more fancy in general, I'd say. But Brooklyn is like wild. It's a place to be. It's really great. I, I heard someone say, and I, I can't recall who it was, but someone involved in the in the scene there saying a lot of the talented young chefs are learning in New York or, or Manhattan, but then they're leaving and going places like Nashville and Denver to start because of the expense. Oh yeah, yeah. New York is it's it's yeah. sad. It's awful. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. The name of the book is Sarah Moulton's Home Cooking 101: How to Make Everything Taste Better. She is also the host of the television show on PBS called Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Any other books coming up soon? Oh, no, that one nearly killed me. <laughs> that's my fourth. I think that's my best. The two in the middle are just quick, easy dinners, which is great. The right. first one's like my autobiography, but this is, this is really dense. There's like 100 and some photos. There's 150 recipes. There's lots of how-tos. It's, it's dense. You're also on the radio, too, on NPR. With, right. Yes, Milk Street Radio. Chris Kimball and I answer questions from callers, awesome. much like what I did when I was on the Food Network. It's really fun. I bet that is a good time. Yeah. That is a good time. Yeah. And then you're, you're continuing to do some writing for... Um... Associated Press. Okay. Every other week I do a new recipe, a photograph. I do the photograph now. I do the styling, the propping, the photographing, and um, 300 words. So okay. it's just a seasonal recipe. And if people want to find you online, they can do so? Uh, yes. My website is sarahmoulton.com. Okay, yeah. and all kinds of good stuff. I've got there. Instagram and you know Twitter, and you you go to my website, you'll find all the rest. You got to have all that in today's world. You do, <laughs> you do. It's it's fun. I like Instagram in particular. I like shooting awesome. photos. Yeah. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Same here, Jeff. Thank you. You bet. I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Sarah Moulton. You can find her on PBS, and of course, uh, as we mentioned, sarahmoulton.com. By the way, you can find more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also on Facebook and YouTube, but I guarantee our pictures are nowhere nice, nowhere near as nice as Sarah's. <laughs> I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by Gulf Power, a Southern company. And by viewers like you. Thank you.